Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Files Obscura podcast. This episode is brought to you by Anch- by the Anchor app. If you were like me and probably didn't know where to go to start a podcast or didn't know what to do, then you'll be very glad to hear that the Anchor app is free to download and gives you everything you need available on your phone or your laptop. And you will be given all the tools you'll need to edit, to play music in the background, to have live guests record your episodes with you, and so much more. Anchor also allows you to distribute your podcast anywhere that you want to be heard, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the list goes on. I know ourselves, so far, we have at least seven platforms. Um, And another great thing is that you're able to start making money for your podcast with absolutely no minimum listenership. So if you're interested in starting tomorrow, you can also start recording advertisements tomorrow if you were so interested. But everyone goes at their own pace. You know, all you need to know is that this is everything you need to make a podcast and so much more to help you along the way. It's user friendly and easy to, and easy to figure out, you know, as time goes on and you figure yourself out. So all you need to do is go download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, that was a n c h o r.fm to get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Crystal, and I host the podcast Alternative Interests with my best friend, Elle. We're Washington natives that love true crime, the supernatural, and all things weird, dark, and spooky. Join us every week as we take turns sharing our own twists on the garbage humans that commit crimes or a paranormal story that we have been obsessing over. Whatever topic we cover, this show is sure to capture all of your alternative interests. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome, Agents New Listeners. If you wish to stay up to date with the latest episodes or any news you might have missed, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram or join our Facebook page. If you'd like to join in or start in some discussions with other agents, we have a Discord server available to everyone. We also have our episodes up on YouTube, so please consider subscribing and share with your friends. Thank you for your time. Now let's get into this week's case file. Hello, how are we all doing today? Welcome to this week's episode of Files Obscura. We are uh, trying a little formatted beginning. Um, I'm personally not that good at it, but I hope it came across well. How are we doing today? Doing pretty well. Doing well, doing well. Awesome. Uh, This is one of our more uh, just general discussion episodes. so, So we're a little laid back right now, you know, with life going on. We've got a lot on our plate. So I figured it was about time we just have fun with with today's episode. Um, If you haven't been able to tell about today's title, we're going to be talking about our theories about the future and, you know, the advancement of technology that always coincides with it. That sounds like fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, there there was a few things that I specifically looked into, you know, stuff that affects, you know, our farming, economy, you know, or just society as a whole. And then I looked at, you know, how time progressed with technology and, you know, those big jumps in in our technological evolution in the past, you know, few centuries and stuff like that. And it's interesting to see the trends and seeing how things change and how people change with it. Uh, So I figured, you know, it would it it would be fun to to speculate the best and worst of what could come, especially after this year. Okay, you know. But uh, with, with, with that being said. I have failed to be a good host and introduce my, my co-host. We have Vlad <laughs> and CC. I am hey just guys. so tattered. Uh, we needed this episode. Good. We needed this episode. All right. Yeah, we needed a break. You know? Yeah, we, we, we do. Because I know with the last couple weeks, we were really falling behind there. And I am, again, I apologize about that. But, you know, we're having fun. We, we've got a lot of, a lot of things on our plates. You know, so balancing balancing the two is you know proving to be a real challenge. Yeah. So we're we're restructuring some things behind the scenes, and, and we're trying to get back on track. You know, but uh, with, with with that being said, uh, let's get into today's topic. Yep. You know, as always, like we did last time, we do two truths and a lie. We do this every episode. I figured let's take some facts over the things I've researched. Let's look into it and see if we can uh, if I can stump you guys because Cece's on a roll. She's three in a row. You hell are, yeah. You uh, get two in a row, or I think one I, in a row? I think two in a row. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to stump you guys. I really do. I don't remember if I got the one. No, I didn't. I'm confident. Uh, I'm confident. I don't know. 
I don't know because I'm I'm only halfway through the episodes tallying yeah, what's what. I, I know at least two. So okay, all right. Okay, so I know Cece's excited. She wants to win. <laughs> I'm competitive as hell, dude. I know. All right. So what's uh? I'll, I'll let me see what you got. Okay. Well, I did some research, you know, in, in farming because food is undeniably one of the most important things to, you know to human civilization without food we don't have people without people there's no advancement there, there's no technology honestly you know? it really sucks that i have to pay to survive but you know whatever <laughs> I mean, yes of course it's but like, it's but like, i gotta buy food to survive to but, live what this is an outrage I... <laughs> but well we always hear about food shortages yeah and, and there's not enough food to go around which in itself is not true there's technically enough food that everyone can be fed on this planet but the ability to grow food easier and sustain a more um what, what's the word i'm looking for a, a more habitable environment people have looked into different ways to kind of orchestrate and save water you know enrich plants and stuff and one thing I came across was different different farming styles, such as like hydroponics, aquaponics, and, and aeroponics. Aeroponics I have not heard of before. And when I looked into it, this is statement number one, is that aeroponics can be used to reduce water usage to, to plants and everything by 95%. Okay. Yeah, you, that, that is... How? To, to perspective, because, well... The way that aeroponics work, work is that they allow the roots to be free and open, and through a controlled set of time, they miss the they miss the roots water, allowing the the roots to not only get oxygenated, but it, it it gets a mist that has all the nutrients and you know chemicals that the soil would naturally carry, and be able to go up you know the roots in a more efficient manner. So they've been able to reduce the amount of water used because a lot of the water that you put into plants and everything. A lot of that just drips into the soil. It doesn't actually get absorbed by the roots. So this method just eliminates that that waste. Okay. So I, I don't want to ask too much about it because I know okay. it might be a topic or whatever. And I'm like, I, I want to give you a fair chance. And if, gonna, I feel, if I if I feel we're, like it's we're, we're going to get into it in this episode anyways. Yeah. All right. Cool. Because uh, it goes into a lot of vertical farms, okay. which has been a whole idea and a half. Interesting. Yeah. So. Continuing with, with the farming thing, I, I, I try to, to look into other into other methods because, you know, water treatment's a big problem. You know, the, the whole reason why, you know, aeroponics is being considered is because of how much less water it uses. But there's another side to this coin that most people don't consider is the fact that we have water. It's just a lot of it is salty. So what do you do with all this salt water? Well, up until recently, there's been nothing we can do with it. However, researchers have been able to devise a new type of greenhouse using seawater. Okay. So statement number two is that the seawater greenhouses encourage, you know, soil enrichment that is used to grow crops in the desert. So long story short, you know, the way that this works is the, the natural salt and mineral content that you find in water mm -hmm. is being used in, in uh, interesting ways out in the desert in, uh, in Somaliland, all the way out in uh, East Africa, I believe, um, where it's being used to grow crops in the desert where in the past it had never been able to be used before. Hmm. Okay, interesting. I mean, by the way, both of these sound legit so far. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm thinking. You're waiting for the one that stands out. Yeah, but none of them do, so that's... Okay. I, I mean, we're, we're talking about the future. I mean, I, yeah, we are. That's why, like, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> th at the same time, at the same time, like, salt water. I'm trying to think about, the, like, I'm trying to think about the science behind it. What, well, I, I, what I, I know about our, our agriculture and salt and minerals. Yeah. I'm trying to see if... Well, we, well yeah. the biggest thing is, is also... The people behind this are MIT researchers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of their science even I didn't quite gather, you know. Okay. Hmm. All right, then I'll put that. I'll, uh, I'll put. I'll put a little maybe on that. Okay. One. What about you, Cece? What do you think? Well, the thing is, it's like I was agreeing. They both sound entirely plausible because obviously it's the future, infinite possibilities, yada yada yada. So I'm just I'm waiting for the third one to see which one I think seems okay. the least feasible. Yeah. Okay. Let's wait for. 
<laughs> well, you know, I think this one is one that you guys are going to get pretty, pretty easily because it's been out in the news lately. Okay. You know, aside from just the food and, you know, water salination techniques and everything like that, there's something else major that's going to affect us. And, and that's the economy. America's economy is in the shitter right now. Despite what they tell you on the news about it seeming great, we're all in a terrible spot. So when we're on the breaking point and China releases their new digital currency, of course, everyone's going to, you know, question what, you know, what the future is going to look like with an all digital currency. You know, I did some research looking into this and looking into the history of cryptocurrencies and, and virtual currencies as a whole. And, you know, the reason a lot of people worried about this one is because the digital yuan, you know, third statement, by the way, is uh, it's the first digital currency that's completely backed by the Chinese, that, that's backed by an entire country. It's backed by China and it's backed by China's central bank, too. So it's backed by their gold standard. So their digital currency is, is backed by, by something tangible. It's not something based upon statistics like most cryptocurrencies. Or it's not based upon our belief that it has value like it is in America with our fiat system. Okay. Hmm. So I've never, I actually haven't heard about this in the okay. news. Cece, have you? Um, I'm not really up to date in the news, to be fair. I'm quite bad. I've been avoiding it lately just because, again, everything is so dark and depressing. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's pretty bad. It's 2020. Yeah. There's always something new every single week. But I checked up and it's always um, something sad. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to avoid you for the day. <laughs> so because I haven't seen the news and because I haven't seen this specifically in the news, I don't want to say this one's the lie, but something about a virtual currency backed by the government seems a little off. Like, I don't know what it is. Uh, because it presents an Orwellian concept. I mean, yeah, that 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 seems off too. But I think it's also just the weird, like, okay, so you have your regular currency and then you get your virtual currency. But they're not the well, same thing. Well, no, 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 no. That's the thing. The digital yuan is the, the currency. They're getting rid of their physical paperbacks. Why? Oh. Because of the virus. They're making a completely contactless transfer of money. Everything's becoming virtual. It seems like that's really good. Open that's opened up a lot of uh, ways for people to get money stolen, though. <laughs> yeah. You would think I can think of a lot of things that could go wrong with virtual. I mean, we, yeah, many we've things. We've seen it happen. We've seen it happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, by the way, has not always like I, I, I. You always hear about Bitcoin like messing up. So I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking like, okay, well, Bitcoin was first generation. First generation is never going to be flawless. Mm. So it's either the first, let's say you're the last one or the second one. I totally believe the first one, by the way. The first one seems extremely believable. The second one, it's a little weird because salt water some, somehow being used to like grow crops in the in the desert or in, in just areas where I don't know, like I but you tell me that the third one's on the news, but I haven't seen the news. So I don't know, like maybe maybe it isn't. I have, in the third one, this sounds the most ridiculous. You know, the virtual currency sounds a little far fetched, and like, but we're talking about future tech, so is any is everything is anything far fetched? Okay, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say the third one's a lie. You're gonna say the third one's a lie? Yeah. The you sure? Chinese virtual currency. You mm -hmm. sure? Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay. UCC. See, I'm convinced. I'm sort of caught up because I reckon the third one is potential because it, it's China as horrible as it sounds it's China <laughs> it's a communist state man yeah it's not exactly known to be the uh, best place in the world and I'm sort of caught up between like the first and the second being the lie the second one makes less sense than the first but the first still seems a little bit uh, improbable Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with second. You're gonna stick with the second one. All right. So yeah. I'll say third. You say second. You guys sure? I'm sure. As I'll ever be, most of the time it's just me guessing, and I've not, it's not gonna be wrong so far for the past three episodes. Right. So you never know. All right. 
if you guys are sure, I'm going to go ahead and lock you in then. Lock me in. All right. So, Vlad, you say the third one. Cece, you say the second one. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. Like, you know, like I said, you know, food is one of the most important things on the planet for humans to survive. Yes. So I figured that's always a good place to start doing some research and, you know, look into some things. And I was curious to see about how the future of farming and food growing as a whole um, is going to change. And it's definitely going to change for country. It's going to change for region because of customs, practices, economics. X, Y, Z. There's a thousand reasons I go into a lot of people's decisions. Yeah. Some of the more traditional, you know, farming people who, you know, put all their stock into like dairy or, or produce or something of the sort, you know, who, who stick with one crop, especially in the last decade, have been seeing a massive decline in, in you know, their sales and they've been having a lot of waste of, of product. And so they've been losing money. Uh, a lot of people have been barely able to break even. Um, and I followed a uh, kind of a documentary report of sorts based on one family out in, I believe it was Wyoming. They had changed their whole model to be more diverse. You know, they said, why would you ever put all your, you know, all your money in one stock? You know, put it, you know, change it. And they changed their, their, their planning based on economic reasons. Um, to, to be more of an organic farm. So they have a wide variety of produce that they sell. They have cows, they grow five, six different crops. You know, they rotate them out, you know, every you know growing season and whatnot, they said. And, and they've been able to increase their, you know, their finances three, four times. Wow. Yeah. And it's just, it's just about diversifying, you know, what, what you're capable of. And they didn't, they didn't do anything different. They still own the same amount of land. They still pay the same amount of taxes and still pay roughly the same amount for supplies and everything. So it, it, it's just when coming, when, when looking at, you know, the future technology and how things are going to evolve, I learned pretty quickly that a lot of what's going to change us isn't new technology. It's just how we are going to restructure ourselves, you know, because one thing that I'm saving for the very end of our discussion, you know, AI is the biggest thing that changed the world. You know, and we're still only in the early days of seeing how far reaching it can be, you know, and it will play into digital currencies and stuff like that later on. Um, but it affects everything from, you know, growing cycles uh, like these organic farmers were doing, you know, calculating growing cycles based off of, you know, these AI statistics, mm -hmm. you know, to everything, you know, in social media and, and tracking what you like, what you don't like, what you follow, you know, what you order X, Y, Z. You know, so we're, we're coming to an age where privacy is not becoming, you know, a viable thing anymore, you know, which it, it's strange. But like I said, I mean, AI privacy to an extent, I guess, privacy to an extent. Well, yes, but like I said, I wanted to save AI for the end of the conversation because it's such a hmm. big umbrella. Yeah. You know, but they do use it in, in you know, farming tactics and everything. Um, which, which was interesting because I didn't expect to see, you know, economics play a bigger, you know, a bigger role in deciding things. Although I should have seen that coming. I, I watch and read a lot of reports about how people are, are changing, you know, their business models and everything just because of economic choices. Um, but one thing that has become one of those more long term projects, you know, the, the things that don't make a quick turnaround. Um, was vertical farms, which is so which is so interesting because vertical farms is a concept that I believe dates back to like '85. It, it is a concept of you know growing food in a skyscraper, if you would, you know, and you see vertically. Yeah, you see all these uh, pictures from artists and everything online who they'll make these skyscrapers and weird autistic looking projects of, of food just growing everywhere and hanging vertically and nice eye-pleasing patterns or whatever and it's pretty but the truth of the matter is it's not really like that stylized form that you'll see it, it's when you look up you know real vertical farms that exist today you'll, they often they'll uh, own low-rise buildings and stuff and they'll just rent out the and they'll buy out the warehouses and they'll just stack all the plants right on top of each other you know along with their you know, light and, you know, humidity 
uh, temperature, everything, all the equipment is what I'm trying to say. All the equipment that gauges, you know, their growth, their CO2 levels, their light that they receive, you know, everything essential for plant growth. They'll, they'll stack all these units right on top of each other and they'll stack, you know, 15, 25, 30, all the way up to the ceiling. And they'll have them much like how you'll see warehouses just in rows and rows and rows next to each other. And they fill out most of this warehouse and only need about a handful of employees just to make sure all the equipment's working fine, just to measure plant growth and just to track data. So that's interesting. Um, That's a lot of work, but at the same time, I can totally see the benefit behind it. Uh, It sounds like it's more complicated to deal with than a regular farm. But at the same time, if something goes wrong outdoors, like you got this in indoors farm that you gotta work now, you know, it's it, you know, all your all your work is being done inside, all the lighting. Exactly. So it's, and, and well, that's with that's the unique thing about vertical farms is like you said, they work they work year round. It doesn't matter if there's a drought, it doesn't matter if there's a blizzard, it doesn't matter if there's a hurricane. You know, as long as your warehouse is properly protected and insulated and everything. These things can grow year round and at an accelerated rate, two to three times faster than the normal growth of these uh, vegetables traditionally. Um, they, and you know, a lot of these companies early on were experimenting with different styles uh, of growth, you know, hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. Um, hydroponics was something I, I've been very familiar with for, for a while. And what that is, you know, is basically just a, an, envi- an enclosed environment with a bunch of fish and other aquatic insects and, and, and life forms with plants that create an ecosystem that naturally encourages uh, like CO2 production and everything else that a plant would need to grow in such an environment. That's so cool. So mm-hmm. you're basically just recreating- it's a, it's a self-sustaining farm. Yeah, you're just exactly. recreating the natural way that things work. Can live and life. you can scale this up. You can you know do this privately. You can own a greenhouse and do it. You can do it cheaply out of PVC piping and stuff like that, you know. And then there's aquaponics, which is a similar concept. However, you yourself are enriching the water and filtering out and, and taking everything. You don't have animals and plants that take care of it for you in an enclosed environment, you know. So very similar concepts. It's just how much work you want to put into it, how much, you know, time are you willing to put into it, and stuff like that. Um, you can make a labor world. glove kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, but at the end of the day, it allows, you know, you to grow your own crops. You can be self-sustaining. Yeah. But the aeroponics was the one that caught my eye because I had not heard this term before, you know, and looking at some of these companies that were talking about, you know, how they were able to exceed, you know, their, their growth rates while diminishing costs. They explained that you know they most of these companies switched to an aeroponic system because they were able to reduce water usage by up to 95 percent in some cases you know allowing them to bring their water costs down to almost nothing while encouraging these plants growth at an accelerated rate two to three times you know average you know and they can do these year round and they can do it with any plant as long as you know the optimal growing conditions of the plant they have the equipment available to allow that plant to thrive. So I guess we're just as a species getting a lot better at like creating farms because now we got a whole ecosystem built just to make farm, mm-hmm. you know, just to make plants grow better. So that's so cool though. I, I think it's really cool. Well, the problem so far is like, again, as great as this is, it does not have a quick turnaround because the operating cost and the manufacturing cost it's early a lot of on yeah. is very expensive. It sounds like a lot of maintenance. That's a lot of work. It, it's one of those. It's one of those jobs that you have to be able to see long term. Yeah, you have to. And I think, I think it's a really cool concept, and I can see it working really well in some desperate situations where maybe there's a draw, a drought, or um, some kind of hurricane came in and destroyed everything. And it's like, well, we still got this little warehouse here. You know, I, I can yeah. see it happening, like working for a lot of desperate situations you know uh freaking uh nuclear apocalypse happens hey we still got the warehouse yeah. exactly yeah. you know we still got and... the warehouse all safe from that <laughs> well well the good thing about that is yes we have you know the the technology right now and every year 
we are always getting better. Technology is always becoming cheaper. Manufacturing costs are, are always going down. So again, yes, this is something you have to be able to see long term, but it's not something you have to see too far out the gate, you know, before you see your money back and everything. I think this is just one of those things that you just have to market right, and it's really going to take off. People are really going to get into it because people need food. Everyone needs food, of course. you know. And with the massive, you know, social political change, you know, wake that we see, you know, especially here in America right now, you know, America is usually one of the early adopters to a lot of things uh, up until the last 20 years or so, you know, and that's mostly because all of our tech giants around the world are based here in America. Yeah, they're based in Silicon Valley, you know, so. You know, for this to really take off, I think it's really going to have to be that the American conscious public, you know, people of our generation, you know, are going to be the ones that have to really want to usher in this kind of change. They really want to push for, for these, you know, kind of future projects. That's where things get a little complicated because, you know, the way, you know, the way things currently are, um, it, it's going to have to be done for baby stuff. If we want, it, if it wanted to happen, we have to take baby steps. We got to do what you know. Got to ease people well, into that. Time. That's going to happen no matter what you're talking oh, about. The problem is, is that we need to take the steps. We aren't taking the steps. That's the issue. I think that's one of the other issues as well. Is that uh, unfortunately for most of the world, um, people don't like new things. Remember when. Um, Franken food and GMOs were a thing where people argued for the longest time of how dare we mess with food, how dare we um, do this, this and that with food. Cause remember well, it was um, trying to stop diseases or something similar and everyone was in a huge fit over it. I, I remember and it, it's, it's important to be aware of how things can be used wrong. It, it is very important because in a you know in a perfect environment you could be able to use these you know use these farms and grow food for everyone but in the wake of something like economic excuses that we keep hearing all the time here in america the that could be used as an excuse to take these down because of the you know the early high maintenance you know cost and development cost and everything you know that could be excuses that are used to, to stop these from advancing and stuff like that and it's terrible it hurts to hear, but you know, the things that are worth doing are never going to be easy. Yeah. You know, well, with an ever changing world, people like might not see the benefit in something like that. They might not see the benefit in having somebody to work on. Like we, we want to make things cheaper, and we want to we want to make it more efficient. Yes. And this might just be something that is a nice little like. Uh, it's a nice little pro uh, passion project for someone, or it's it's a cool little experiment. Or hey, look at the look at the little thing. Bring the school bus in. Check it out. We only got one of them in the whole country. Like <laughs> right? Yeah, it's it's gonna be one of those things. Unless something drastic happens, and it's like, well, I guess this little crazy experiment might actually be good for something. Well, and, and like I said, I, when I looked at the future, I didn't expect so much politics, you know, to be involved in it. But of course. How could I be so foolish? Of course, there's so much politics involved with oh, what can happen in the absolutely. future. So when even you if you don't want them, like they're still there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because when you get to stuff like this, stuff that is you know is going to be great, the biggest problem as to, as to why a lot of stuff doesn't take off is that not enough people are having the right conversation about it. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I see as uh, one of the biggest issues. You know, it's because I like you see these you know kind of videos and, and research papers and people talking about the news once in a while but that's it it's just a blip and those are usually the stuff that people don't pay attention to you know it's like oh, okay cool something great happened people are going to stick around to the terrorist bombings and stuff like that people are going to stick around to national tragedies people want to know what happened then but not enough people are, are are wanting to talk about you know the good things in the future the things we can do now I mean, people. You know. I feel like people are more quickly to act whenever there's a threat of any kind, but whenever there's something that uh, could potentially either stop a threat or just make society better, they will ignore it. Unless you're, unless there, it's there's a possibility that this could go wrong. They're not going to do anything. Of course not. But, yeah. 
that's just that's just society, you know. I mean, humans are also more equipped to be morbidly curious than we are uh, helpfully curious, I put it. Yeah. yeah, we'll be like, oh, that's cool, but nobody will do anything. Well, I mean, like, like I said, it's just having the right conversation about it, being exactly. able to talk about it in the right way to encourage people to want to learn more. You know, I think that that's instrumental to to having change for advocating for change. Yeah. You know, and that's actually interesting enough. A little lesson I learned from a Republican woman who is trying to push for the Republican Party to focus more on green energy. You know, because the way that she puts it is that yes. She's aware that global, you know, climate change is real and everything. She's aware of the positive benefits of renewable energy. She's also a diehard Republican. Problem, she said, with Republicans is not that they don't see it as an important issue. It's that their focus is on money. So you have to make the conversation about, about money. money. You have to change how you talk about things. She definitely sounds like she's a... Uh the black sheet of the conservative party she's not a very prominent member but i think she's actually pretty well respected oh, that's good you know but yeah it was just it was one of those weird videos i saw throughout the research that uh because i was looking into renewable energy and stuff like that yeah. um that was just uh just kind of stuck out to me because i think it's important when we talk about all these advanced technologies and stuff like that is that most of these people I could I could go to the mall and talk to people about these, and they'll look at me with a blank stare. But if you tell them you can make money off of it, it's then like, they're going to want to listen some more. Yeah. Exactly, and it's sad, but that's just you know, well, mm -hmm. you know, people don't want to focus on other people's problems because it's not their problems, you know. But I'm a firm believer: helping the world helps you. Yeah, I agree. You know, and in speaking what of what goes which, around comes around. Exactly. You know, and, and, and speaking of which, I wanted to look more into farm and see if there was anything else I didn't know about, um, to which there was, you know, like I was talking about, the saltwater desalination uh, is a big thing because aside from food, water is the most limiting resource that we all have on this planet because we can't drink any form of water that has, you know, above 3% salinity because it is poisonous to us. It will kill us. You know, which is funny because flamingos can drink uh, salinated water that's like 60%. But yeah, little little factoid I found just randomly. Yes, flamingos can drink boiling salinated water that's like up to 60% salinity cool. and be fine. That's, that's actually pretty cool. It's pretty metal, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we drink 3% and our kidneys are failing. But, I feel like we're slightly weak then. <laughs> we're, we're pretty weak. We're pretty weak. In a lot of ways, yeah. But the uh, saltwater desalination is pretty important, you know, worldwide because there's many countries around the world, third world countries that don't have, you know, adequate ways to grow food, adequate ways to uh, desalinate their water so that way they can drink it. Because a lot of these, you know, cities like in Africa, a lot of these communities are based around rivers and coastlines where water is but they can't drink any of that and so they're left you know dehydrated and hungry um but as far as water desalination itself goes there hasn't been too many advancements although there's now a bigger push into research and development uh to you know be able to desalinate water on a mass scale and a lot of people have been looking around at technologies and stuff like that to see what they could do uh because tr traditionally what we do is that we chemically treat the water to separate it um, but other people now are looking towards you know using physics as a way to you know consider this because when you go into areas like the desert or um you go to humid areas you know in, in africa or the, like the savannah or something they have these designs these theoretical designs for these wire mesh nets that when these moist air winds come going across um, Africa, it would connect onto these little wires and collect dew droplets, which would fall down and collect into, you know, a collection. Oh, cool. And that way they like would be able- Like a spider's to web. Exactly. And they would be able to pull, you know, the, the water out of the air. Well, the way that this, you know, would best work is, you know, keeping these wires cold so that way the water vapor can condense onto it. Um, and there's a bunch of other theoretical models that I've seen basically following this principle. 
you know, which I think would be great because depending on how you manage to keep these wires in cold, what materials you use to develop them, you know, and how efficient you can make it all work, you can keep your costs very low and be able to, to plant these around a bunch of tribes and communities who would, you know, benefit the best, you know, who would benefit the most from this. And this could be used anywhere. This could be used in Cuba, South America, you know, Africa, Australia, out in the outback, you know, even the deserts that you find out in Asia, you know, communities that live out there could, you know, survive off of this, given that they're in the right environment, you know. But it's, again, if you're out in the desert, it's kind of hard to grow anything. Which brings me to the 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 seawater uh, the seawater greenhouses that I, I found, which is interesting because it's using water in a way I would have never thought. Because um, uh, the seawater greenhouses, you know, they they're designed to allow agriculture theoretically in any environment. Um, unlike normal greenhouses, which are you know really hot on the inside because they're trapping in the air. In an enclosed environment with all the co2 and greenhouse gases and all that what these do is that they keep the area cool and the way that they keep the area cool is that they'll take the seawater and they'll pour it over these corrugated cardboard pieces and, the, and these cardboard pieces are almost like a foot thick but the, they build a wall that can stretch the whole expanse of the greenhouse area and they'll pour the salt water over it and when the uh, warm air blows through it blows through the holes in the corrugated cardboard, cooling it down and bringing the water vapor that's from the cardboard into the area, both humidifying it, allowing it to uh, more adequate temperature conditions to grow, um, allowing plants to grow without burning up and drying out. Huh. So yeah, so it, it, it's a, it allows this to, to grow in a lot of desert regions like the Saharan Desert, and you know out in uh i forget what the desert out is in uh, asia there we i go. feel like it would it would feel like it would be left open to lots of things that could go wrong this so it would have to be something that's definitely researched enough before it was uh viable to have something who's long-term sustainable <laughs> oh they have they've actually done the research and, and uh when they were testing this out in somaliland um, they were able to create these models that showed uh, to support all 10 million people in uh, Somaliland, they would need about 10 square miles of, of area to grow all the food, and they would need about $100 million, which sounds like a lot, but is less than 1% of Somaliland's uh, GDP. So it's really, it, it's really inexpensive. It's really cheap and quick to, to set up. And it allows you to grow crops in an area you were never able to grow crops before, allowing food production to be possible in your area. Well, that sounds like something we can definitely use in exactly. this world. I, I, I mean, yeah, it's all it's super beneficial. Exactly. Um, and considering that uh, the world is constantly, quote unquote, running out of space for places, that would always be useful to have something in the desert so, then, because obviously yeah, you know because yeah with, with like you know deserts all around the world just being expand you know just these big expanses of wasted space you know there you have talks about people who say theoretically how many you know solar panels you know would we need to fill in an area and then you'd see the sahara desert you see these tiny little squares on it that says you need about this much space to power up the whole world with solar panels and it's like I grant it, I know it's in theory, and it's a much more complicated question to answer with economics, with material cost, X, Y, Z, maintenance. But it's, it makes me want to ask, like, why don't we do this then? Like, why the hell aren't we doing this? It's the same reason. Because we're selfish. Yeah. We're yes. selfish creatures. And you can't get people to pay for something if they can't. Of course not. Of yeah. course not. If they can't profit off of it, they don't want it. Yeah. You know? And we have a it, solar panel at my parents' house, um, and that heats up our water for us. So if it's a sunny day, we don't need to turn on the heating for the water. We can just turn on, uh, boost it, and we have water for the day. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't know that. It's really funny, though. The people with the most money, the people who can afford all this stuff, don't 
really benefit from anything like this. It doesn't benefit them in their lives. And it probably doesn't, you know, they have to have a good heart and like, yeah, you have to be a, a truly altruistic person to, to you don't want to invest big into something like this. Yeah. That's why it, it's so important for, you know, public, you know, research projects and, and stuff like that to be approved because people need, you know, we need to experiment in ways to advance, you know, a lot of technologies and rethink how we solve problems because, you know, up until this point, nobody had ever tried to figure out how do you salt water to grow crops before. You know, this is the first big attempt I've seen of people directly using salt water instead of trying to find a way to um, to chemically treat it, to desalinate it first or whatnot. So it, it was just, a, it, it was a kind of an interesting surprise uh, I didn't expect when I looked into, you know, farming and the future of food and everything. I feel like part of it is will... I mean, yeah, but... But like, um, I, I'm just sort of thinking, um, like, okay, there is this big tech here, and it, I think as, as people, you know, we we gotta, if we want to push this forward, if we want people to listen, maybe the easiest way to do it is just to sort of start small, small, like uh, setting up one, just convincing people, hey, set up one of these. Um, see what happens. Like, okay, see the difference. I, I don't, I don't know. Like, it, it's. It, I think we can get to a point where we we can build more of these. But um, yeah, I I really do feel it's completely possible, especially this over the fancy indoors farm. Yeah, I, I feel like this is more likely to be accepted. Well, again, this is also easier to set up in the short term. It's easier to see turnaround for something like this. And, and although it does provide, you know, an optimal environment, you know, in theory everywhere, this will really only take off in areas, you know, that really suffer from dry climate, like deserted, you know, countries. Yeah. So again, you probably won't see that here in the States other than in small little pocket areas. You're not going to have that big discussion here, you know? So that's why when we talk about you know, the level of people and homelessness that we see, you know, in big cities and states, you know, vertical farms may be a more appealing discussion because of the quantity that you can produce, <laughs> not just the fact that you can do it anywhere, you know, because yes, it is expensive, but it would allow you to be able to lower the cost of food in your area and, you know, lower shipping costs, lower, you know, possible exposure to pollutants and everything like that, because it's right in your city. You know, you could have smaller private independent companies that set these up, that sell to, you know, be local distributors to a lot of smaller companies, you know, and you can encourage, you know, a lot of, you know, smaller, you know, markets and, and uh, business owners to buy from these places. I mean, there's a lot of potential good that can happen from either or. It's just depending on what question are you trying to solve? You know, what problem are you trying to answer? So, yeah, you know, that, that that's just, you know, couple things that I saw because there, there, there's a few other theoretical stuff that I saw you know that deals with you know ways to alter plants like in GMOs to you know help them grow faster and accelerate you know and stuff like that but then there's always the dangers of what happens when you manipulate an organism too far and you know you get unforeseen mutations and xyz and, and which is, it, it's an important conversation because there's always two sides to a point you know with everything, you know, new and breakthrough with technology, there's always good and ill intent that can be used with it, you know? So yes, when we run into GMOs and problems with our food, you know, it, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. But I think for the most part, I, I'm pretty okay with what we're doing. I think we got enough good people aware of how to grow good food that we don't have to worry necessarily. Yeah. You know, I'm a little more I cynical. I'm a little more worried that things are going to keep going up in price and that we will uh, have to pay more for what we have uh, less and less in supply. Well, I don't blame. Well, what I'm saying is, I don't think that there's necessarily a problem with the food production itself. How it's marketed and sold, however, those are different people. I think we just can't expect Bill Gates to do it. Like, you know, no. I mean, no. If, if anyone's going to do it, it's going to be the people. The people are going to have to push for it. 
Well, it, it, especially now, it, it, it's going to take a private collective of people who want a common goal and are willing to work for it to get anything done. Because we are too hmm, divisive, definitely. we are too segregated. It's going to take a group of people wanting to get things done to get things done. It's going to take people who aren't going to sit there and wait for some leader to tell them yes or no. They're going to be like, no, this is what we want and we're going to do it and it's going to happen. Yeah. You know? But until we, you know, there's enough people willing to work together to do that, I don't know. I can't see the future. So, yeah. You know, but with all these technologies and everything that we're looking into farming, like I said, with the organic farming and how they change their crops and everything with the vertical farms um, and even the computer models that they use to measure, you know, stuff with the seawater greenhouses, a lot of energy has been, you know, needed to, con- needed to allow these things to happen and need- needed for these operations to take place. And the consumption of energy is one of the biggest questions and problems, you know, a lot of engineers and, and researchers are, are looking to solve for the future, you know? So of course, when we talk about energy, we want to look at the the latest and greatest thing there's one question in physics that we haven't been able to quite crack yet and that's you know nuclear fusion you know fusion you know as a whole just to kind of give a you know brief description it is the process of which you know nuclear uh the nuclear uh parts of an atom you know protons neutrons you know get superheated and smashed together to create new elements and, and in the process releasing you know, vast amounts of energy, you know, with, you know, Newton, Newton, what am I saying? Einstein, my mind's in a lot of different places. With Einstein and his, you know, very famous equation, E equals MC squared, you know, which is, I don't remember the full equation, but that's actually only half of it. Um, He was able to mathematically show how energy and matter are the same thing. And this is important to understand when we talk about fusion energy, because in, in, in a kind of an analogy, what we're trying to do is build a star on the say on on the the, the the surface of the planet. With that in mind, we have an issue of vast amounts of energy and vast amounts of re, uh, of resources that it takes to try to jumpstart fusion. That cost is really the biggest issue uh, when it comes into development because. There's so much that that it, that goes into this um, into these designs. You know, we have two different styles of of, of fusion reactors that we use um, that use different. Um, one uses lasers to, to to superheat a small fuel pellet. Another one uses magnetic coils to help a plasma, you know, stay you know, flowing in one direction and and to keep generating energy and stuff like that. And both of these designs have been improved since the, you know, the seventies and eighties when we first started using uh, nuclear fission. Yeah. Um, Which I I think we've mentioned this in an earlier episode while we were talking about the, uh, the atom bombs. Yes. But, um, I just wanted to bring up something real quick. Um, so my girlfriend actually studies this stuff in college and she just sent me some notes. And I wanted to let you guys know, because this this is actually true. I, I remember I was reading one of her books, and this information wasn't there, and I totally forgot to talk about it. But uh, people aren't not, like, remember how I, I told you guys that the people are the ones who have to push for all this? Mm-hmm. In most cases, the people don't push for this. They push back on No, it. I know. And the reason I say this is because uh, it's, okay, the reason we don't have wind turbines everywhere is because a lot of people don't want them in their backyards. They don't like the way they look. It doesn't benefit the people. Oh, exactly. So if anything, the company should be the ones. No, 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 because it does benefit the people. They just don't see it that way. They, of they see don't. it as an eyesore and a problem. Yes. So if anything, companies and like, like they, we, society as a whole ain't going to do it. But small organizations that develop, like that they, they, yeah, small organizations that go for this kind of stuff, that that's their main goal, they're the ones who are going to make the change. Not the, not the, not the neighborhood. The neighborhood, the neighborhood's never going to do this. Um, but yeah, this is actually something that's happened before. Um, and, and if we want a safer environment, if we will if you're what 
None. She, oh. she was showing me some notes and it just it made me laugh because uh, the, one of the sections she highlighted was how people often, you know, would outcry, not in my backyard, and they shortened it to people suffering from NIMBY syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> not in my backyard. <laughs> Which, I mean, it, it's a big issue because especially, you know, when nuclear energy was first becoming a, a common thing, uh, people would point out to all the nuclear meltdowns that were happening due to early design failures and things we didn't understand yet yeah. and they would they would point to that being you know the biggest problems you know that we face the issue with that argument is the fact that these still only accounted for such a, an a, a minute fraction of a percent of all the other you know uh plants that were you know producing nuclear fission energy you know and doing it safely and so it really you know, damage their image, even though in reality it wasn't as bad. Yeah. It's just, it's easier to, to say something's a problem when there's a fire to point to. I also think most people aren't that, like, they don't really do the research. No, they don't. Kind of stuff. We don't really pay attention. So, um, if somebody tells you, like, hey, look, a nuclear reactor is actually one of the safest and more, like, um, and it's it's the safest, but it's also like gonna give us the most energy, you yeah. know, uh, out of all the different like renewable resources. Um, people aren't gonna believe it because they've seen movies. It's like, oh no, I saw that saw that thing blew up. Like, you right. know, it's like it's, people people are easily swayed whenever the thinking is taken out of the equation. It's like Brian Cranston's wife died more of those. I'm not gonna do it. Like, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, as humans, we are driven to want the most efficient experience with whatever we do a lot of the times. Whatever is going to be more more efficient for us, and if we can take thinking out of the equation, we often do, and that's why it's so problematic in this day and age. In the age of information, we have more morons now than we did 50 years ago. Yeah, and, and it's just because people are easily swayed, people are easily manipulated towards one view or another just based on, you know, half truths and full lies. Yeah, you know, and, and it's just it blows my mind. You know how far people will go to not discuss things i mean hell even now when we talk you know to any of my friends online on, on facebook or whatever when my friends will start you know to just say but that's your opinion i just immediately know that this conversation is no longer worth talking about because they're willing to hide behind you know one statement just to feel like they are still justified in whatever they say it doesn't matter which first and also off, then we can rib into like flat earthers and anti vax exactly. as well because again wait, wait. we've proved this i know i know but it leads to two big problems that i have when people throw out these conversations and, and you know stating it's your opinion or something like that first off most of the stuff that we talk about is not opinion based it's yeah. facts based i support my stuff with facts my opinions are based off of facts so you cannot say it's my opinion when it is supported by facts. Exactly. If, if let's get a little topical, I guess. Uh, if mail-in voters is such a big deal, which it isn't, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, the percentage for uh, mail-in voter fraud is extremely small. Uh, may I just add smaller than the coronavirus step rate? Um, and that's itself, it's not a big deal. Oh, yeah. You can't just say, Oh, it's a big enough problem when it actually isn't. You can't shut down the entire no. UPS because of because of the the dangers of mail-in voter fraud. Well, also, and here's the thing. Here's the reason why it's also so ridiculously, you know, just blown out of proportion is because the the head of the UPS, uh, you know, department or whatever, he uh, he has even stated that even if you were to send out the mail-in voter registrations for everyone who wanted it across the country, it would only increase the workload by 1.5%. That is very minimal. And he said he's even willing to pay overtime for everyone to do that, to get it out on time. And yet President Trump keeps going out saying how it's impossible, they're not going to do it, they have to rehab it reform within the next month, and that that's totally possible. Which, by the way, it's not. It's not true. He's been consistently lying. And that's... Of course! No one's surprised! No one's surprised. But that's the thing. The, you can't just say this is your opinion when this is a fact. Exactly. And, and like that, you're right. You're right. You're completely right. Calling everything an opinion does not help anyone because not everything no. is an opinion. An opinion, an opinion is I like curry better than ramen. Exactly. That's an opinion. But even more. 
Here's my second problem. Why can't you debate an opinion? Why can't you debate a viewpoint in order to help form and, and create a better viewpoint? Why can't you have a constructive argument about something you both equally have valid agreements to disagree on? You know, why is that such a taboo thing? Why is it such a problematic thing to discuss views? And, you know, in an effort to, you know, gain a better insight or form Part of it is, opinion. I think, people don't like to feel wrong, which I, I, I can get no. that. I, I, I come from a family of know-it-alls, trust me, I, I get it. it it's, yeah, it's just, uh, I, at the end of the day, I want to be right. And if I'm wrong, please tell me how I'm wrong. Yeah. I don't want to sit here and just be wrong and everyone looking at me like, what a fucking idiot, you know? If, I wish more people were like that. To, exactly. And if it comes down to a matter of opinion and something in the gray area of discussion or, or choice or whatever, I'd rather talk it out and try to see what a general consensus would be. You know, I often believe that the best answer lies in the middle. So it takes conversation to find that middle point, you know? So it just when people give these rhetorics and this, that, and the other to just shut you up, to make you feel right, it's the laziest most ignorant thing in my opinion you can do and it's really taken a hold of social media especially god is it just so infectious mm-hmm. but yeah i think we're talking about future tech <laughs> <laughs> well future tech you also got to see how it's going to be used against you yeah you know Which, I guess, oh i guess that that's how it all ties in you yeah know? i mean because yeah. like i said there, there's two sides of this point there's all the good that it can do for us like like i said with uh, with farming with nuclear energy, when we finally hit to that threshold that, you know, it's not gonna cost us more money to, or, you know, it's not gonna cost us more energy to make what we get out of it. You know, that'll be, you know, a big, uh, big thing. Which speaking of, uh, I mean, this is actually a, a question we still don't have an answer to because I thought, you know, when, when you think of research uh, on fusion technology, it's always a question of when's it gonna get here? When's it going to be here? It's already here. Here's the thing. Yes, it technically is already here, but the, the question isn't, is it possible? The question is, is it sustainable? And that's the question we don't ask. Because one thing that we don't actually have an answer to is if fusion technology will ever actually be viable technology for us. We don't know if it's ever going to be to a point that it will actually start benefiting us. because it. The amount that it costs and the amount of energy it takes to create what we can keeps making us lose money and lose energy. And if it, we can never cross that threshold, yes, we may be able to create fusion reactors all over the world, but it will do us no good as we are wasting money and energy mis- getting these things to run. You know, because they there there's a simple formula used to calculate these things that all these theoretical, you know, fusion reactors uh, are measured by and it's a Q scale. And what it is, is basically um, what they're trying to, uh, it's how much they're spending divided by what they're trying to uh, obtain or something like that. I I can't remember what exactly what it is, but basically it's a simple formula to determine the efficiency of the reactor. And the the world record right now is a 6.7. And that's understood with a one being the break even point. Mm-hmm. You got the same amount of energy out that you got in. So with us currently only being at a 6.7, we don't know if fusion technology is ever gonna be possible. You know, But if we can make that breakthrough and prove that it's possible, that we can do it, the amount of energy we'd be able to you know, spread around the world would be phenomenally large. You know, we will be able to reach a, uh, an upper echelon of what we're capable of doing because we have the energy to do it. You know, I mean, if yeah. it's impossible, it's definitely not the uh, foreseeable future. Oh yeah, but you know, there, another side of this coin, you know, more so than just creating energy, is, is storing energy. You know, there, there's been a lot of you know these startup companies that are looking how to redesign capacitors and batteries to see how they can try to make things more efficient or, or to make new designs that allow you to take advantage of certain properties and certain materials and XYZ. Yeah. You know, Tesla's big on, on, you know, their, you know, lithium ion rechargeable batteries. You know, they got a pretty efficient model down. They've been able to commercially make it available, you know, on, on some scale. 
but they haven't re- been able to redesign the battery. They haven't been able to change it. You know, we got companies that have been able to, you know, make these large scale half batteries, if you would. I didn't really go too far into looking at how these work, but basically their design was creating these large, like half cell batteries, you know, and allowing you to, to arrange them in a uh, series fashion. You'll be able to uh, store, you know, a significant, like a 40% increase in, in energy that you would normally be able to store traditionally in the same amount of space. Mm. But again, you know, this isn't really groundbreaking technology. You're not advancing it. You know, one of the best theoretical technologies that we've only just started to, you know, see be tested, you know, is solid state batteries. Now, if you've never heard of a solid state battery before, it's helpful to understand how traditional batteries work. You know, typically what you have is a chemical mixture either with a gel or, or fluid of some sort uh, mixed in with, you know, zinc, copper or some other materials or similar properties to create, you know, a cathode and an, uh, or, and an anode. So that way you have an electrical cir- uh, circuit that can flow because of this electri- uh, this chemical property. Mm-hmm. Solid state batteries, however, change this by having a completely solid interior. It's nothing but, um, you know, solid materials such as, you know, metal plates ceramics you know graphene mesh sheets they have too um you completely eliminate problems that you'll have with gel and liquid uh cores you know because with the lithium ion batteries that you have everywhere around the world at this point you know you run into two problems you know which is you know lithium dendrites which are these little i won't call them crystals per se but these little things that will start forming in these uh, chemical cells because of the the lithium ions that we use in our batteries because they're so good at holding and releasing a charge. Um, The problem is that these lithium uh, particles will break off over time and start collecting a mass uh, of other elements and create these non-usable parts, decreasing the ability of the battery. The second problem is known as Coulomb's efficiency which is the ability of the battery to um, transfer energy from one spot to another through a medium, you know, through one material to another. And, you know, with these, you know, with the lifespan of a battery, the, this, go, this uh, efficiency inc- increasingly goes down. Mm. And so that's why you'll see with your phone after a couple of years, it doesn't hold its charge as long. Hey, it's taking forever to charge up. That sounds, that sounds like my car. Mm-hmm. It's basically the same exactly. thing. It's Cause, cause it, well, it's not just that. It's a lithium ion battery. It, yeah, it's, it, the, it's the state of the battery itself. So um, basically, you have an electric car, and it's, uh, it's from a, it's kind of old. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a leaf model, which was one of the very first commercially available electric car models. And it's to a point where it's a, the, the battery is at half its capacity. Yeah. Um, and you can definitely tell because uh, I have I can I make this three minute drive every once in a while through a highway. Yeah. And by the time I'm back, uh, well, no, by the time I get there, <laughs> by by the time I get to my destination, the um, battery is basically like almost fully gone. So I have to charge it at the destination, and then when I'm back, it's almost gone too. So if the car was brand new, I'd be able to make it for, forward and back and probably still have enough for like a trip to the grocery store. I, it, it's, it's so funny how that works. But if I got a Tesla model, that wouldn't even be an issue. The car exactly. could be just as old and it probably still drives us as well. Mm-hmm. Because uh, over, over time we've developed these things so much to the point where they're super efficient. And if you have a Tesla car, I mean, congratulations. You got a really good car right now. <laughs> All right, um, but but you know, with with questions about the solid state batteries and, and whatnot, is that's going to be the biggest push in the future? Because even those Teslas, like I said, they still use lithium ion technology. Yeah. Yes, they have found a more efficient way to, to keep the batteries running. But if you can uh, switch that out with a solid state battery, you'd be able to hold an even longer charge. Yeah. Because uh, because the problems that you face with the traditional battery is also the amount of space that you'd have to compress energy and you know changing up the design of the battery into what uh even samsung came out with a few years ago to as just a test model to to, you know proof of concept they were able to prove you know that with these new designs with uh 
solid state battery that they developed, they would be able to go ahead and, you know, increase the capacity almost by like 98% or, or not 98%, 98 times more efficient wow, yeah. uh, for the lifespan of the battery. They were able to increase the space by like four times. And, and so the output that you get is phenomenally more efficient. If you take the same size battery uh, at like 900 uh, watt hours for traditional lithium ion battery, that would translate to, I believe, almost 10, no, no, I believe it was like almost, yeah, almost 10,000 watt hours. Mm-hmm. So 900 to 10,000 mm-hmm. with the same size battery. Well, I will say, um, oh, go ahead. You were going to say something? Uh, I, I'm going to say, I hate to interrupt, but it's currently 10 to 9. I'm fucking starving. I may, uh, I, I want to hurry guys up just because I haven't eaten since lunch. <laughs> so I want food. Good. We're, we're, we're almost done. We're almost okay. done. So. I was just going to say, it looks like electric cars are um, significantly more popular now um, than they were before. And if if that means anything, it just means that the technology for electric cars is going gonna, gonna to definitely evolve, and we're going to try to make them more efficient. It's the same way we're making phones more efficient, uh, battery-wise mm-hmm. and tech-wise. So this seems like it's a near-future tech. Oh, oh yeah, no, like we already have, you know, testable models and everything. Yeah, so it's coming sooner. Than it's-, it, it's just a matter of getting manufacturing costs down while keeping efficiency up. Yeah. Because the biggest thing about new technologies is that it can't just be better; it has to be worthwhile. Yeah. You know, this is definitely going to be. Important. Oh yeah, oh yeah. W- once we got this, you know, solidified and everything, is this really going to help with stuff like you know space travel and everything like that? Mm-hmm. Now that you know Tesla has created these reusable rockets that we can, uh, that we can use time and time again, and proven to work. We've had you know our first successful space mission that has brought people to the space station and back safely. This is going to make you know tourism in space possible. It's not just theoretical anymore. It's going to happen. It's going to make the cost of space travel drop dramatically because now we aren't just using one-off rockets. We're using we can reuse the same thing. Yeah, you know, I just want to visit space. That'd be cool. Oh, I'd love to go. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, man. I'm not good with heights, so like, really, you put me at the highest. I hate heights. I still want to go. I, I think it's just one of those once in a lifetime experiences that if you got, if you can do it, do it. It would be so cool. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, dang, I'm gonna like piss myself. This is not gonna be good. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I would love it. It's cool. Um, I'd rather go to Disney World, but. <laughs> I've never but, been Disney World. I want to go there as well. <laughs> yeah. And one day, hopefully one day I can go. Hell yeah. But of course, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this development it depends on our, you know, economy, our ability to pay for these things, our ability to, to test and research and pay the employees that, that do all this stuff, um, which America lately has been feeling very threatened um, because China, not three months ago, announced that they will be releasing and testing their new digital currency, the digital wow. yuan. Yeah. Did we get it wrong? You got it wrong. Wait, oh, oh, it was the first one that was, it was the first one that was live, right? No, the second one was live, because that's the one that you said. Second one, uh, like I said. God, that's right, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should have, I told you, because <laughs> the plants don't get, in, the soil doesn't get enriched. The, the, pro- the problem was that the temperature needed to cool down to allow plants to grow. That's right, that's right. That uh, was the issue. Dang, all right, yeah, never mind, right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go on. <laughs> but the digital, the, the digital yuan is uh, currently being tested in four different uh, con- uh, cities right now. I was about to say countries. Uh, they're being tested in four different uh, cities right now, and the digital yuan sets itself apart as it is the first digital currency that is owned by the by the state, it's owned by China and is backed by China's central bank. It's backed by their by their uh, gold back uh, gold stock, so they're able, you know, to have this digital currency. Which everybody then immediately asked the question, well, what about privacy? Well, you got to understand with China the way that it is culturally, they're very open. Everything is tracked. And for us Americans, we value our privacy, which again, I believe is important, but I think context is also important to understand why certain technologies are going to take off and they won't take off here. 
you know, for them to be open, you know, everyone knows who's buying what, you know, when it comes to like computer systems that are tracking, you know, uh, you know, cameras and stuff like that and restaurants, everyone who signs in to see that, that computer footage is, you know, the, the computer system makes note of it. So everyone knows who has seen what it, it's complete, uh, open, you know, open information for everyone. It, 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 it's, it's basically either everyone's uh, secret or everyone's open and they've chosen that everyone's open which is why the the it, it's a scary thought i know but it, it's one of those things that i think is essential for a digital con- uh, digital currency to take off i think it's one of those things that is essential for digital currency to be a staple and it has a real chance to because china doesn't just have to work with america China has a bunch of other countries to work with, and now that they don't have to work off the U.S. dollar, which the uh, the entire world market is based off of, they can go and do their own thing free of you know U.S. dependency because we don't have, they don't have to use our currency anymore. Wow, exactly. You know, and you know all of this uh, is put onto one profile or one account that is that is owned by the states. So that way, like, even if you were offline or out in the middle of nowhere and you didn't have service, you'd still be able to pay because you have this, you know, this registered ID mark that if you go to pay for something, you know, virtually like this, your ID mark will be left and it will be notified how much, you know, you spent on X products. So you'll never, you're never without money, you know, and it's a lot cheaper and easier to, to use, you know, especially in the face of the pandemic, you know, you have contactless payments. So you don't have to worry about touching, you know, any screen or in, or touching any person, you know, to, to make a payment, you know, so th- there is a lot of upsides to it. But like I said, it, for me, it really takes understanding the right environment for something like this to, to take off. I think China's just got that environment to make this work. And I don't see it as a problem here in America. It could very easily become a problem, but it's because culturally we're very different, you know, we value our independence. We value our privacy. We want to be able to be autonomous to ourselves, you know. So a digital currency would not take off. Here. No, it would, you know. I mean, fun, sad- fun little fact. Um, in my secondary school, we would put money on our fingers, quote unquote, and we would pay with our fingerprint, basically. So that's how we paid with stuff in my secondary school. Hmm. Which is interesting. That reminds me of. Have you guys ever seen Altered Carbon on Netflix? No. Uh, isn't that like a cyberpunk show? Yes. Yeah. It is very good. Uh, one way, it's based in the future, like hundreds of hundreds of years in the future. And the way that they make payments there is either by a handprint or a DNA scan in which any form of DNA could be used. Uh, in one example, uh, the main character, Takeshi Novak, is uh, he's taking, you know, his partner who just got shot uh, to the hospital, they're making them wait because uh, he hasn't paid yet. He spits on the screen and then they accept his payment. That's and, funny. Well, because the, the plot of the story is um, he gets hired by the super, super, super rich billionaire. So he, who pays them a good fortune of money, but the hospitals are notoriously expensive. So they didn't expect him to have money to pay for her treatment. So whenever he spits on it and the lights up green and all that, they're like, oh, okay, we realize you you have money. And they, they, they treat his partner and everything. That's kind of cool. <laughs> but, but the point was, is like, you know, DNA scans and biometric scans, that technology is here. You know, at least the biometrics as, as a whole, there are companies that sell scanners. When you go to work at Taco Bell or anything like that, they have biometric scanners for your thumbprints and everything to clock in and clock out. I, I still, I'm still impressed every time I can just tap my card on a screen to like pay for something. So I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I, I just think they're gonna, they're gonna try to make it more and more efficient to pay for things with, uh, with your cards or. Honestly, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But when, when doing so, you have to ensure privacy. You have to ensure security, and that's why you know getting into you know understanding digital cryptography and everything and and the stuff that we use in place with coding and and, uh, all these you know security systems like sorry excuse me and all these security systems that we have you know to ensure our privacy and even still you know we get fucked over because americans are stupid because you can have all this protection on your card 
but then you write down your your pin and id number or whatever somewhere all it takes is somebody seeing that and they got into your account you know so it, it, there's a lot of you know pros and cons to, to, to stuff like digital currencies and cryptocurrencies and you know different institutions that uses you know currency differently you know like i said in america we have the fiat system where our money is based on our belief and our money exists that it has value which is the most fairy tale thing i've ever heard of you know it's like these this piece of paper has value because I exactly that that's <laughs> all it is that's all it is and the fact that we got the whole world to base the 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 economic you know their all the world economics on our dollar baffles me mm-hmm. it's like the greatest con in the world that's that's literally what it comes across to me as <laughs> but you know with with the you know advent of this digital currency that's backed by the chinese state i'm really interested to see where things go in the next couple of years Because it could be great. It could actually be a really good thing. You know, I've had theories about the future and what it would take for a good progressive future to exist. This is one of those things that I feel like we've reached an age, you know, with, with, you know, AI and everything, you know, where privacy is, yes, it's being eroded every day. Um, And, and, you know, our, our privacy is becoming, you know, one of those things that we don't think about, but is fundamentally important to our society. However, with the age of the future coming and and the advancements of AI technology and, and how it's infected our lives the way that it has, you know, with social media, with jobs, with political rigging, you know, all these different things, because it's data. A lot of data you can do so much with. It's coming to a question of can we stop it? Can we stop the the what I believe is the inevitable uh, of the AI getting all of our information and there's nothing we can do about it? Now, when you say AI, what are we talking about here? We're talking about like computer, um, kind of like the, the the computer reading we've seen, or where we can recreate faces out of thin air, or are we talking about like I mean, Boston, all of it, Boston Dynamics, all of it. All of it, all of it, because AI as a whole, just the, the the technology behind the algorithms that track us and monitor us, that allow companies to grow, that allow companies to know what we like, what we don't like, what we're interested in, when, where, and how. Okay. You know, the, the technology itself is constantly advancing, and it it doesn't need to be completely sophisticated to completely eradicate a job. I've seen a lot of documentaries that explain that, you know, we are afraid uh, of robots taking over our physical labor jobs, but the biggest problem is actually white collar jobs we're talking about your receptionists we're talking about your accountants we're talking about people that work in offices they're the jobs that are more likely to be taken away with because they're the jobs that are simpler to encode into a program they're the jobs that are easier to break down into an algorithm for a computer to take over Hmm. so those are the jobs that are going to go away first well yeah and I do think that there's benefit to AI. I think benefit, like, there's definitely things that a robot can do that uh, an average man cannot and yeah. should not. Um, so I would trust the robot with some tasks, maybe anything that requires intense amounts of counting and, like, math work that maybe an average dude just, like, can't be trusted with. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, I don't know if you've seen this before. I don't know if you've seen the clips. It's on, it's, it's on a channel somewhere on YouTube. But Disney's been working on this technology for their movies where they basically created a robot stuntman that, I mean, that sounds fucking awesome. Yeah, I saw it. I know what you're talking about. And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a dude doing that jump. That, that would kill a regular ass guy. Uh, but it wouldn't kill a robot. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? The robots can handle this one. Like, cause stuntmen, like, they're great for like action scenes, but like, you want to put a guy on a trapeze and then make him like jump off a roof? Like, come on. Um, so uh, there, there's some thrill junkies that would argue for it. You I mean, know? that is true. There's, I think some of those parkour dudes, they're crazy. So like, yeah, I, I used to be one of those parkour dudes. Really? Yeah. For oh. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I gained the weight and stopped caring and All right. nah, my body's not for it anymore. All right. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, with, with AI technology and everything like that, I see it as, it's inevitable no matter what you, you want to argue because it's here. It's already impacting our lives in such a massive way 
and we need to be able to learn how to live with it. We won't be able to control it. We need to learn how to live with it. I, I feel like um, with AI, uh, especially, okay, so I'm sure you've seen that online. Uh, computers are getting really good at faking things. Yeah. And oh yeah, they're, I don't think they're to the point where they're indistinguishable from reality. You can still kind of tell when something's off. It's getting a lot harder, though. It is getting a lot harder. The uh, artificial voice, I, I've seen the tech before, and it's really impressive because it goes from, like, it goes from the generic, like, you know, the one I'm talking about. It's it's a guy who's like, you know, I am a robot. Can't you tell? You know? And, and yeah. But now it's like, now it sounds like a dude who stutters every once in a while. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really impressive. And the scary thing is just if it gets to the point where you can fake somebody's voice over a phone call, you know, like I don't know what that can be used for. Uh, will it make my uh, will it make your Siri sound better? Maybe. Uh, can it steal your identity? I hope not. <laughs> and that's that's like that's what I think most people are afraid of. Um, now a robot picking up a box and doing a backflip. That's cool. People like that. Uh, people don't like it whenever a robot starts making fake faces and fake Facebook profiles and going around saying stuff that isn't true. Um, there is AI that can create fake people mm-hmm. that don't exist. Like you can reverse image search them; they never existed. Yeah, the face was never. I mean, real. in the fourth and Don Canoe Valley, doesn't it really? Yeah. It's some scary stuff, some Black Mirror stuff. Like, <laughs> well, like, exactly. But like, like I said, with all this technology, these are things that don't have a mind of its own right now. Mm-hmm. These are things that are orchestrated by people. Yes. And so when it comes down to it, it takes people learning how to deal with this. It takes people willing to take the steps, saying what is okay, what is not. Mm-hmm. I believe that there's always going to be some problems. There's always going to be those few bad eggs that either due to circumstance or due to characteristics will do bad things with these with this technology. Here's my prediction on, okay. on this technology that we're currently talking about. Uh, I think at the moment we're in the stage where we're trying to push it as far as we can. Let's see, like, like let's see how far we can go. We have people all over the world developing new um, tech that can simulate or can um, create things out of thin air, and it's getting really good at it. So we're going to get really good. We're, you know, we're getting to the point where, okay, you can make fake faces. Okay, you can make those fake faces fake talk. <laughs> you can make those fake faces fake, fake talk and have a fake voice. Okay, cool. It's all, it all is obviously fake. You can tell it's not a real person. They sharpen it out. Okay, now it's extremely convincing. Okay, cool. Something goes wrong. Somebody's like, oh, somebody used that for a, a bad thing. Let's set up some laws. Let's set up some rules on what you can and can't do with this tech. We, we reached the limit of how great we can get, maybe. And now we got to realize, okay, this is illegal. This is not. You're using it for a video game. Cool. You're using it to, to you know, mess with some people. Kind of kind of iffy. You're using it to, like, do some illegal shit online. That's the problem. Well, here, here's my thing, and, and where I'm going to disagree with you a bit. It, it, a, we're not, we didn't reach the height of it. We are just breaking the cuts of it. I know, we're, I know we have. Well, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is I don't think uh, the way that you're describing it as we, we are reaching a point now where we can focus on laws. I think the, the point of us focusing on laws, it, it was, we're, we're overdue. We've been overdue for over a decade, if you would. These are things that are coming and going too fast mm-hmm. and laws take so long to finally take effect. That these are things that we need to start being able to look ahead. These are things that we need to start thinking ahead of time. Yeah. And for that to happen, we need a conscious body in Congress that can look at these problems, that understand technology and understand where it's going to be able to make these assessments, make these laws, these appropriate laws. Because if we keep having people who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s making our laws for us, they will be giving us antiquated laws for, for a future that does not belong to them. Oh, I totally agree. I think just the people currently in charge, they don't know about this. They don't know how exactly. Facebook works. They, and, and, yeah. and I'm a big believer that it's based upon the generation. And the day that I turn 60, 70, 80, I am not in a position to, to talk about the future anymore. Yeah. I will be dead soon. It is uh, all I can do is listen to the people telling me the problems of the day and do what I can from there. I will say, like, just I, I think just because somebody's old doesn't mean they can't like know how this stuff works. No, of course a lot, not. A, a lot of older people work on this technology, 
But the problem is when somebody doesn't understand it, and we've seen this before. We've like, and I'm not just talking about setting up laws that are too restrictive or not restrictive enough. I'm talking about people who genuinely think something can do something it can't do. Like if somebody says um, Mm. Twitter can, uh, I don't know, Twitter can buy, can, can steal all your credit card information and sell it off online. It's like, that's not what Twitter does. I mean, maybe somebody can use Twitter to do something like that somehow, but that's not what it does. You just, you, you just never looked it up online. Exactly. You never read about but it. But again, the issue is also people aren't, you know, they aren't willing to look past today. Yeah. They aren't willing to look past themselves and they aren't willing to educate themselves. That's the three big biggest problems because when, when I talk about the older generation, you know, there are, there are definitely those who, you know, want the best for today and everything. He wants the best for this generation. I'm not saying there aren't, but the general, you know, the general public that is of this demographic, unfortunately only think of how things affect them today and today only, which is fine. I get it. But at the same time, when you only worry about the problems of today, you don't realize how these laws will morph and change and affect things in the future. You know, stuff like uh, FDR's deals and everything, like the Social Security Act and, and the FDIC that he created and all these things and policies he created before World War II, you know, to try to help get people out of the Great Depression. These, you know, like Social Security is one of those things that's really affecting us now because of the baby boomers, they're, you know, they're such a large demographic that is entitled to this, you know, money that's from, you know, social security that they've been paying over the years. Granted, they earn it. It's part of our laws. I'm not saying they don't, but that in itself is a problem because it has taken money away from the populace today and has caused a shortage in what is available for the public to be using for public funds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about how we allocate money and it's laws that are antiquated that solved a problem for its time that affecting us, that's affecting us negatively now. Yeah, because we don't need them anymore. Exactly. And, and so it, it, that's why I said it takes a conscious body aware of the problems today that's going to affect you in the future to, to make these changes. You know, if we just keep trying to make, you know, solve problems for today and only today, we're only going to be stuck in the past. Because exactly. today only lasts once. Tomorrow it's going to be yesterday. The day after that is going to be the two days ago. You know, it's always going to be in the past, and that's the problem with how we think. We got to think of the future, so that way we can focus on problems that will affect us today. Yes. Air quotes. I also don't think we should be extreme. I mean, we should be cautious, but we shouldn't be scared. Yes. Um, because if we're scared, then we never progress. We never go, we never move ahead. And with AI, I think it's something that's extremely beneficial for society. If we use it for the wrong things, if we if we put in the wrong things, then yes, it's a problem. But if we know where to put it, like if we know how to use it correctly, um, I can think of so many ways that AI can be beneficial for a lot of different people, for a lot of different businesses. That doesn't require a person's job to be taken away. I mean, robots are really good for getting into places that people genuinely can't fit in or mm-hmm. shouldn't be in maybe the radiation's too high maybe it it's could, underwater or something it like could that. kill someone like legitimately like they're great for that kind of task uh they're great for entertainment they're great for video games they're great for all sorts of things but you know you gotta know where to use it and don't take a hard-working man or woman's job away from them because it's cheaper to have a robot well, I mean, we're, we're nearing the end of this episode anyways, but uh, you brought up one interesting thing I want to address real quick. And, and it's well, – I've looked at a few economist notes and I've looked at, you know, a few industry notes and seeing how things, you know, have progressed with economics and different models in different countries. And we've reached a point, I believe, uh, where we have uh, – where we have taken that step where we would actually benefit from less labor. We would actually benefit as a society from less people working, but no more than in America, you see people working for hours per capita. 
We have people who work 10, 12, 14, 16 hour shifts. We have people who work six days a week who are almost never home because they're told that they have to work. They have to work and bring home that cheddar. But then there's a bunch of these economists saying that putting all this, you know, work into physical labor is actually costing us money. It would be better if we had less labor and paid people more fair wages. It would be better, hmm. but we don't do it because we're only focused on today. Okay. But yeah, like I said, the future the future is a complicated place. There's a lot of good that can come out, a lot of technology that can help us advance, but the future is ever changing, and it takes a conscious body wanting to progress it in the right way. You know, I'm not going to be that person to, to to force it. I know that, but I hope that I at least encourage conversation towards it. I believe that is the most beneficial thing you can do is getting people to talk about it. Because when you can get people to talk about it, you can get people who want to do something about it. You know, and I hope in some way, you know, that we can encourage that. I know we didn't talk too much about AI and that's in part because I want to save that for another discussion down the road. Um, probably something a little more geared towards self-awareness mm -hmm. and, you know, the manipulation of AI on human influence and everything. Um, but as a whole, you know, it, it's here to stay. It's going to change everything about how we live our lives. And we got, we just got to learn how to move forward with it. We got to learn how to accept it because it ain't going away. Yeah. You know, with, with how it's going to affect everything down the roads. I have my theories about how society is going to change, but, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. You know, I don't have too much to add to this topic. You know, yeah, me I either. think you're good. I think I'm good. Yeah. What about you, Cece? You got any more last minute? Note? Yeah, I, I don't have, I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> well, with that being said, we all hope that you look towards a bright future. Hopefully when 2020 is over, we can have something positive to look forward to. That being said, we hope to see you guys next week. Please, once again, check out our YouTube channel and join in on our Twitter and Instagram page to stay up to date. We love you guys, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.